Okay. Wow. Only 10 minutes late. Um, so, welcome to Math 610, Numerical Linear Algebra. Um, so, if anyone's watching, I'm sorry. Um, this is going to be an interesting one. Um, okay. So, you have the syllabus and uh, schedule already. Um, and there's probably not much of interest to say about that, uh, but a couple items. Um, because actually, yeah, almost all of you have taken a class from me before. Um, so, very important resource the course website. Uh, definitely go there. Um, you'll find the notes there um, and uh, uh, like the, actually, a lot more notes than we can possibly go through in a semester, but at least everything's there. Um, and then uh, the textbook. I actually have. I probably shouldn't be saying this to put on YouTube, but I have <laughs> a textbook in PDF form. So, um, cool. yeah. Um, We're so, coming after you. yeah. So hit me up um, <laughs> before they take me out. Um, so, um, okay. For uh, there'll be um, homeworks given. The homeworks are already posted because um, that's what I've used before, and uh, there'll be a mixture of there's some problems involving proofs and some involving uh, coding in uh, MATLAB, um, or Octave if you don't want to pay for MATLAB. Um, okay, um, now, uh, for a fourth assignment, you'll have a choice. You can do a, a homework assignment that's similar to the previous three, but there'll also be an option that's a coding project that's pretty substantial. Um, so if you want to do more of that, uh, you can. Um, uh, no exams. You know, um, no, no oral file or anything like that. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Um, and the due dates, as you can see, there isn't anything due for a while. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, okay. Um, I'm sure there's nothing else I need to point out from the syllabus. Probably not. Okay, <clears throat> and these are all the notes I have to get through. Not, not today, that'd be impossible. But these, the next, uh, um, well, today and, and the next couple lectures anyway. We'll see how it goes. Um, so, I want to give a quick overview. What kind of problems are we going to look at in this course? And the other thing is. Um, this is numerical linear algebra, not linear algebra. What is the distinction? Um, so uh, the, the problems that we're going to look at are, for the most part, the kind of problems that could be covered in a regular linear algebra course. Um, but there's definitely going to be some differences because it's uh, numerical. Um, so the first kind of problem is solving a system of linear equations, which is commonly expressed in this form, ax is equal to b, um, where a is an n by n matrix, x is um, an n by one vector, um, and these are so x is a solution. So x consists of the unknowns, and b is also an n by one vector that is commonly referred to as the right hand side or RHS because it's written on the right hand side. Um, so. Uh, it's also assumed that the matrix A, and I'll talk more about this later on, is invertible. Um, so this kind of system is guaranteed to have any solution, which is not true for a general matrix, but we won't deal with that um, in, at least not in this part of the course. Um, now, um, there are two 
general types of methods that we will be covering. Um, first category of methods is called direct methods. Um, for instance, Gaussian elimination. followed by substitution, um, and so on. Now that uh, you would have learned in a uh, typical first linear algebra course, uh, like Math 326 here. Um, but the procedure is it's largely the same uh, when it's numerical linear algebra, where in numerical linear algebra, it's a computer that's doing all the work, not you on paper. Um, and when that happens, certain issues come up because every single operation that's being performed has some error in it. Um, and you want to make sure that that error doesn't accumulate to such a degree that your answer is now um, unreliable. Um, so, so that aspect causes some changes to the Gaussian elimination procedure that you normally wouldn't have to think about. Um, working these things out on paper. Also, questions of efficiency. Suppose we are solving several of these systems of equations where the matrix A is the same throughout, but the right-hand side B keeps changing. That sounds kind of crazy. Why would you do that? But in fact, it does come up, and I'll explain why when the time comes. Um, so you want to uh, minimize the number of operations that must be performed, and how do you do that? So these are um, new aspects of a problem that wouldn't come up in a class like uh, 326. Um, now, the other category of methods also would not be brought up in such a class. Iterative methods. Um, well, it's a good chance around this time that I might have uh, my uh, uh, student in numerical linear algebra aficionado, Amber Sumner, come and teach some of the lectures, especially in this part. Um, so, I should probably remind her of that. Um, so, uh, so, so, so uh, iterative methods um, are where you already have some guess at the solution, uh, and you want to keep refining that, that, that guess uh, and get closer and closer to a solution. You might not solve the system of equations exactly, but perhaps you don't need to. What if you only need the answer to have been, say, 1% uh, error? Gas elimination doesn't give you that. Uh, it'd be nice if you have if you require less accuracy, but you can do less work. So iterative methods allow that. And there's other advantages that I'll tell you about too. Um, um, so, and there will be several iterative methods that we'll see. Uh, some are called stationary or non-stationary. Uh, one of the non-stationary methods is a very famous conjugate gradient method um, for certain types of systems uh, that uh, we'll spend a lot of time on. Okay, so that's one um, particular problem of interest. Um, and then um, the second major problem, and this is uh, getting down towards the end of the course, is uh, eigenvalue problems. Um, so you try to solve this equation. A times x is equal to uh, lambda times x, where A is again n by n, but not necessarily invertible. It doesn't have to be this time. Uh, x is a vector of length n. Um, notice I'm saying x or b is always n rows by one column. So by default, Vectors are assumed to be column vectors, unless specified otherwise. Or if I really want a row vector, I would just indicate uh, taking a column vector and transposing it. Um, so lambda is a number. So it's one by one matrix or a number. That could be real or complex. Um, x, the vector x, uh, must be non-zero. And that is called an eigenvector. And then the number lambda, which could be zero, um, 
is called an eigenvalue. Okay. Um, so um, it's very useful to be able to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a given square or n by n matrix A. And the reason is, this operation on the left is matrix vector multiplication. And that's a rather tedious operation. Whereas the operation on the right, you're just taking a vector and scaling it by a number. A very simple operation. Um, so if we're able to find vectors x and corresponding numbers lambda that simplify this operation, then that helps us to actually take functions of a matrix A. For instance, uh, the reciprocal or inverse, which is useful for solving systems linear equations, or exponential of a matrix, which is useful for solving systems of differential equations involving A. Um, so uh, that's here's some of the many uh, uses that eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, have. Um, I should mention for uh, certain iterative methods, one problem that I used to spend a lot more time on this course before wanting to spend more time on iterative methods in general, but we still need to talk about it, um, is to be able to solve a third problem the least squares problem, which is similar to the first problem, where you're again solving AX is equal to B. The difference is A is, excuse me, an M by N matrix. So the number of rows and number of columns can be different this time. X, therefore, has to be an N vector. And B has to be a vector of length M. And we are interested in the case where M is strictly greater than N. Um, so, in general, you cannot be assured that this system even has an exact solution. So what you do is, instead of making AX exactly equal to B, you try to make AX, A times X, close to B in some sense. So you want to minimize that gap between AX and B. Um, and we have to discuss, well, first of all, what does that mean? Um, in what sense do we want to make AX and B close to each other? And having established that, how do we actually do that? Um, so this, being able to solve this kind of problem is an important ingredient in certain iterative methods that we'll see. Um, but the least squares problem is a very important problem in its own right, even outside of iterative methods. <clears throat> okay. Um, and uh, the methods that we'll see for eigenvalue problems are also going to be iter iterative in character. Um, now, those of you who uh, actually, well, all of you have taken numerical analysis, you either took 560 or 772. So you saw, for instance, like Newton's method. Um, that, uh, that is for solving single nonlinear equations. Um, so here we'll be also making heavy use of iterative methods uh, that will get closer and closer to exact solution, never actually get there. But at least um, I mean, in, in um, uh, numerical computation, you can only expect to get so close to an exact solution anyway. Um, so for all practical purposes, you have something that could be as close to the exact solution as uh, possible. Uh, given the uh, limited amount of precision that you have. And uh, the error that comes up in computer arithmetic that affects all of these methods, I'm going to spend some time on that as a standalone topic. Um, since that's something that affects all numerical methods beyond, even beyond the ones we'll see um, in this course. So, so this is what we'll be uh, discussing. Um, but um, before we can really get into these problems, we have to make sure that everybody is on the same page when it comes to just plain old linear algebra. Um, now, I'm very thankful that this year is kind of an exception. I've, I've taught this course a million times. Um, and it seems that just about every time I teach it, there's a, 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 maybe one or two people in the class who are not in the math department. They come from a different pro department on campus and they need some high level math course that they think, oh, I'll take linear algebra. Um, yeah, they haven't seen a matrix in 10 or 15 years, but hey, what's the problem? Hmm. Well, then they end up dropping. So, um, 
uh, but at least I won't have a problem with you guys. But still, um, I want I'm going to take some time, you know, the first few classes to um, review um, a lot of con essential concepts from plain old linear algebra that we're going to need uh, to explore numerical linear algebra. Um, so some of you might find this uh, uh, boring, but um, tough. Okay. Oh, now I see that post. <laughs> yeah. I did. What? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I, I tried. Pull, I pulled a Facebook here and it, it didn't show up. You're not supposed to be lecturing it on Facebook. It didn't come. But I wasn't lecturing, Ben. I was stalling. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, now, um, okay. Oh, Cover these already. have no other chairs in this room, but you can try. <laughs> I'm laughing because she laid up and said, can you move my chair? Like, everybody yeah, I'm not <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. <sighs> indicates which of the unknowns you're multiplying by. So notice we have a11x1, a12x2, one, one, and a1nxn. And then we have a value on the right side, uh, b1. Um, and then all right, so I keep, keep on this process all the way down to the Last equation, the nth one. to write out system linear equations this way. Um, uh, so instead, we just represent the system by these three entities. We have a coefficient matrix. Uh, so I'll, I'll always use capital letters to refer to matrices. Um, and we can arrange the coefficients within the matrix the same way as the coefficients are arranged when the equations are written out in full. Okay. Um, and then 
we have our right-hand side, b. And I'll always use the uh, vector symbol. I'll try to always remember that um, to indicate what is a vector. Because I know some mathematicians, including some in this department, they won't use any special notation to indicate vectors or matrices or anything. They'll say, just use the context to infer it. Um, but I don't want you guys to have blood shooting out of your ears. So I'll try to help with notation. Um, OK, so b1, b2, up to bm. And then we have our vector x of unknowns. x1, x2, xn. Um, and as I mentioned, vectors will be column vectors. Um, now, <clears throat> so if you have the matrix A and the right-hand side, names here, so right-hand side for A, and A is also referred to as simply the matrix of the system, also referred to as the coefficient matrix. Um, but I'll just generally say matrix. Uh, if you have a matrix on the right-hand side of the system, that describes the whole system. You can write down the equations from there. And as you recall from your first linear algebra course, um, that shorthand alone is enough to work with it when you go about solving the equation using processes like uh, Gaussian elimination. Um, but matrices are useful, even as a notation, they're useful for more than just describing a system of linear equations. They can also be used as a way to describe linear functions on vectors in one space to vectors in another space. Um, so if you have a matrix A that has m rows and n columns, then um, that, that matrix can be used to describe a, a linear function from a space of all n, n vectors, vectors of length n, so like Rn or Cn, that's your domain to a space of all vectors of dimension m, like rm or cm. Um, and I'll be talking a bit about vector spaces so you can um, have all, be refreshed on all the fundamental concepts, or maybe they weren't taught in whatever linear algebra course in the first place. But again, we'll get everybody on the same page. OK. So. Um, So if you have a given system of linear equations, from a convention that I just described, you can just read off the matrix at the right-hand side from the equations themselves. Okay. So as an example, you just have a uh, system of two equations and two unknowns. right here, then your coefficient matrix would come from the coefficients of your x's. So the first row would be 3 times x1 plus 2 times x2. And then we have minus 1 times x1 plus 5 x2. And then your right-hand side vector comes from, literally, the right-hand side. Um, all right, so, so here we can go back and forth between one form, one uh, notation or the other. Okay. Now, I need to talk about vector spaces. Okay. Um, so a vector space, I'll use a capital V to refer to a generic uh, vector space consists of a set of objects referred to as vectors along with operations that can be performed on uh, vectors. So um, um, that should 
be more precise here, vector space V over a field uh, F. Um, and for our purposes, um, you can think of F as being equal to either the real numbers, um, R, or the complex numbers, C. We'll mostly deal with real numbers, but I'll bring up issues of complex numbers from, uh, from time to time. Okay. Um, now, um, so the two operations that a vector space must support is um, addition of vectors. So we have two vectors, u and v, that belong to the vector space v. Therefore, their sum must also uh, be in v. In other words, it has to be closed. Um, you may remember this property from modern algebra, uh, like in a group, a group, or also a monoid has to be closed. It's the same idea. Um, and uh, the second operation, scalar multiplication. Uh, so you have a vector u in your space, and the scalar alpha that's in whatever field you're using, you know, real numbers or complex numbers or whatever other field, um, then the, um, the product of the uh, scalar alpha and the vector u must also be in the vector space. So it has to be closed under both kinds of operations. Um, now, uh, generally, the actual operation is quite straightforward, at least for the type of vector spaces we'll be dealing with, would be like Rn or, or, or Cn, where for addition, you're just adding vectors component by component. For scalar multiplication, you're just taking every component of u and multiplying it by alpha. Uh, but for other vector spaces, the operations might be uh, less straightforward. But uh, a vector space must satisfy a laundry list of properties. For instance, addition has to be commutative. It has to be associative. Uh, there has to be an identity element, you know, a zero vector. Um, there must be an additive inverse. There must be an identity element for scalar multiplication, which would be your one, and so forth. I'm not going to write down all the properties in the board, uh, but they are in the notes. Um, on uh, pages 9 and 10. Um, there are no surprises of, of among these properties. Um, so just as a um, quick example um, of these uh, operations, let's suppose the vector space D is uh, R3. Um, so if I define um, vector U, we call vector 3, 0, 1, point in R3. So these would be like your X, Y, and Z components. B is... Uh, minus 2, 4, and 5, and they'll define a scalar alpha to be uh, 1 half. So I can say there's a vector sum, u plus v, um, I can just add the components. So 3 plus minus 2 is 1, 0 and 4 is 4, 1 and 5 is 6, so that is the uh, sum. Um, and then alpha times u, I would just take all the components of this vector, multiply them by a half. So I'd have three halves, zero, and uh, one half. Right, so that's how these uh, vector space operations uh, work. Okay. Uh, and I'm talking about vector spaces because one very important concept is the notion of a subspace, a portion of a uh, vector space. Okay. Um, 
Um, so subspace S of a vector space V is defined to be a subset of V. that by itself satisfies all the properties of a vector space. So any vector, any subspace is also a subset, not necessarily the other way around. I come up with subsets of a vector space that are not uh, uh, subspaces. Uh, in particular, S has to be closed under the operations of uh, vector addition and scalar multiplication. If a subset of a vector space is going to fail to be a subspace, generally that's why. That it, it turns out not to be uh, closed. And it's very easy to give examples of certain subsets that are or are not um, subspaces. So we go back to what will be an often used example of vector space being uh, R3. Um, and I define the subset S to be the set of all vectors um, of this form where x1 and x2 can be any real numbers. Um, so it turns out S is a subspace of V. Um, and you can confirm this because if you take um, any two vectors of this form, the only requirement is that the third component is zero. So I have this kind of vector plus this time kind of vector, with, uh, upper components, y1, y2, uh, then zero. And I add them because I'm just adding component-wise. I'm still going to have zero for third component. So the sum is also going to be um, in S. Um, and then um, scalar multiplication is similar. If I take any vector in S and multiply it by any scalar, the third component is still going to be zero. It's still going to be in S. So S is closed under those two operations. And if all the other properties of a vector space could also uh, could be checked to ensure that it really is a uh, uh, subspace. Um, on the other hand, um, I define S tilde to be a set of all vectors of this form. Any two components are first two, and the third component has to be a one. Okay. Can anyone explain why that would not be a subspace? Doesn't pass the addition test? Yeah, uh, because you take any two vectors in a set, you add them, and you get a two. Yeah, you get two for the third part of it. So, uh, yeah, so if you have u and v in S tilde, u plus v. So it's about as unclosed as can be. So it's not in that set. And the same is true of scalar multiplication. Um, that uh, if you multiply by any scalar other than one, that third component is no longer going to be one. Um, so it is not a subspace. Okay. Um, a very quick way to rule out a subset as being a subspace. Check if it has a zero vector, um, because any subspace has to include the zero vector, because all vector spaces must have a zero vector, and a subspace is also a vector space. Um, this doesn't contain a zero vector. Um, now, a set could contain the zero vector and still tell it be a subspace, but again, it's a quick way to rule something out. Okay. Um,
Now, um, some other very important concepts from uh, um, linear algebra that we will need. Getting enthusiastic. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> we're supposed to have a set of vectors from the given vector space. E to v1, v2 up to vk, and all belong to, well, the given uh, vector space v. Um, I can say a vector v with no subscript uh, v is a Linear combination, or so you, that's also in this vector space, linear combination of v1, v2 to vk, if we can express v this way as a sum of terms where we take each of these vectors in the set, v1, v2 to vk, multiply them by scalars. And add them up. Um, now, one example that actually does not come from our usual vector phases like R, N, or C, N, um, like polynomials. Um, instead of all polynomials up to a certain degree, like degree uh, four, define a vector space of uh, functions. So you can say any polynomial degree four or less is a linear combination of uh, polynomials. 1, x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then uh, these values, the c's, are the coefficients of that uh, linear combination. Okay. Um, now, um, for this, we have this concept, a span of v1, v2, up to vk. That is a set of all possible linear combinations. Of these vectors. Um, and what you can verify is the span of any set of vectors is a subspace. Um, it satisfies closure. It certainly contains a zero vector because you can set all the coefficients equal to zero, um, and so on. Um, because you can take any vectors in this set, those are all linear combinations. If you add them, that's another linear combination of these same vectors and so on. Okay. Um, uh, as an example of a linear combination, so V1 is 1, 0, 1. out that um, V 
is equal to v1 plus 2v2 plus, uh, uh, plus v3. Um, and so you, you can confirm just by plugging and chugging uh, with these. Now, how you determine that these are right coefficients, 1, 2, and 1, is not a trivial thing. What you'd actually have to do is solve a system of linear equations to determine them. But let's give you an example of here's what a linear combination of vectors um, uh, looks like. Um, <clears throat> now, um, so now that we can describe a set of all linear combinations, what we'd like to know is whether any of these vectors are you know, v1, v2, to vk, are redundant. Do we really need all of them to describe all the vectors in this span? Um, so, so a set of vectors v1, v2, to vk is linearly independent if the following is true that if you have any linear combination of these vectors that happens to add up to the zero vector that the only way this can happen is if all the coefficients are themselves zero. Now, if all the coefficients are zero, of course, the linear combination will be zero. But the point is, when you're linearly, linearly independent, it's the only way to make that happen. Um, okay. Now, one consequence of being linearly independent is following that um, any vector that's in the span is a unique linear combination of these vectors. Um, because otherwise, suppose v could be expressed in two different ways. Then you subtract them, and you have a non-trivial linear combination of v1, v2 to vk that turns out to be the zero vector, which would mean it would not be uh, linearly independent. Okay. Um, right. um, So some examples to illustrate uh, vectors that are linearly dependent or not. These vectors, these two vectors are linearly independent. Uh, now, when you have only two vectors 
It's actually very easy to tell if you're linearly independent or not, because if they were linearly dependent, the only way that can happen is if they were parallel to each other. In other words, one is the scalar multiple of the other. Uh, when you have more than two vectors, it's not so easy to tell. Yeah. Um, so, um, so for instance, if I have a vector uh, three, one, two, um, I can express it as a linear combination of these two, and this is the only linear combination that would work that would actually produce uh, this vector. Um, on the other hand, um, suppose I have these three vectors. vectors are parallel. One is twice the other. So these are linearly dependent. Okay. Um, so, so I can express this as a I want to express a linear combination of V1 and V2. Um, All that I would need to satisfy is that, like for instance, to make the first component equal to three, which is the same as the second component, I just need C1 times one plus C2 times two must be equal to three. Well, there are infinitely many combinations of C1 and C2 that will make this work. Um, so V is a, uh, there, there are infinitely many linear combinations of V1 and V2 that will produce V. And that's true because V1 and V2 are uh, linearly dependent. Okay. So now that we have a uh, notion of a span and uh, linear, uh, linear independence, we can define a concept of a basis. <laughs> what? I said this is Dr. Moore's class summed up. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that was actually being tested. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I could edit it out, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I was curious, like, okay, imagine these things have all been seen before, but it's been a while, and it rings a bell. Um, it's totally new, we don't have a problem. <laughs> no. Okay. What? She took her comp on this class. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Now, um, so a set of vectors. Um, B one B two B K is a basis for vector space V if the following conditions are true. Um, these vectors must be linearly dependent. Um, Okay, very nice which V1, V2, up to VK, that's what I'm referring to. Those are linearly independent. Um, so none of the vectors are redundant. Um, 
and the span of them is uh, equal to v. So any vector in v can be expressed as a linear combination of v1, v2 up to vk. And because of the linear independence, that combination um, is unique. Um, now, um, now, what that means is that we have such a basis, any basis of V, then there can be, there can be infinitely many bases of the given vector space. Any basis has to have the same number of elements, the number of vectors in the uh, set, which is k. Um, so we define the dimension of the vector space v to be equal to k, the number of elements that it needs to have in the basis. Okay. Um, the thing is, if you have linearly independent vectors, uh, that tells you that the dimension of the vector space is at least k. When you have a set of vector, k vectors that spans a whole space, that tells you that the dimension of the vector space is at most k, because all the vectors in v can be expressed in terms of these. So you put the two together, and the dimension must be equal to k. Um, so for instance, the dimension of, say, rn, or cn, it's always n. Um, so that's the number of vectors you need in any basis. So in R3, if you have any three linearly independent vectors, that's a basis. <coughs> okay. Um, so examples of bases. Well, for R3, we have a standard basis. In fact, this is a very important piece of notation I'm going to introduce that we use all semester long. Um, If I define these e vectors, so e1 has a 1 in the first position and 0 in all others. e2 has a 1 in the second position, all of which are 0. And e3, 1 in the third position, and all of which are 0. Um, so that's called the standard basis. And I'm using this notation, ei, to indicate a vector in the appropriate vector space based on context, where it's a one in the ith position, and all of our components are zero. Um, now, you've seen these vectors before. How are they often referred to, especially by physicists? They're orthogonal. Oh, uh, well, yeah, they are orthogonal, but just notation. Instead of referring to them as E1, E2, and E3, we call them. Uh, yes. Yeah, they are unit vectors, but the letters. X, Y, Z, I, J, K. I, J, K. I, J, K. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I won't tell anyone what department you're in. <laughs> you were so nice. <laughs> okay. Right. okay. I, J, K. Um, but we're not in the physics world. We're in the linear algebra world. So we call them E1, E2, and E3. Um, okay. Um, now, these set of vectors are also a basis of R for E. Just because you have three vectors and they are linearly independent. Um, now, in fact, uh, these two vectors happen to be orthogonal to each other. So, in fact, um, I'll talk more about orthogonality later. Um, yeah, so these vectors form a basis. It happens to be an orthogonal basis, uh, but it's not the standard basis. So in fact, uh, now orthogonal, by that I mean perpendicular. Um, so these three vectors are perpendicular to each other in three-dimensional space. Um, so there are actually infinitely many orthogonal bases of any vector, uh, such vector space, too. OK. So you can take any such uh, basis and rotate the vectors in whatever way you choose. Okay, how are we doing on time? 6.15. Okay. 16. Okay. <laughs>
Um, well, let's see. All right. Uh, one very important operation to define, and then we'll quit. And I'll probably be behind already, but I'll deal with that on Thursday. I'll still pass her. Okay. Because I mean, we'll still be in the linear algebra review. Okay. Um, now, on the linear transformations, okay. um, so, so V and W, both are vector spaces. Okay. Um, so, a function f that has domain V and range W. is a linear transformation um, if it satisfies these conditions. First, if you apply f to a sum of vectors, that is the same as applying f to the vectors individually and adding them. Um, and this is true for any x and y in the domain. Um, what concept of modern algebra is kind of like for those of you who take that? That's what I was thinking. Um, homo genie? Homo. 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 Oh. Ah. Wait, don't say his name. Homo. Is it not? Homo. 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 I was saying homo over and over again. I was like, homo sapien? I don't know where And this is the addition operation in V, but this is the addition operation in W. Um, and then if you multiply uh, x by a scalar and then apply f, that's the same as taking f of x and then multiplying by alpha for all scalars in the field and x in the domain. Uh, space. So, so any linear function like y is equal to ax as a linear transformation. ax plus b is not because of that plus b. That would be an affine function. Um, okay. Um, now, um, so this is true in general for vector spaces. Oh, I should mention if uh, v equals w, just as notate terminology, we say that V is a linear operator on the vector space V. Uh, so vector from V is input, and the vector from V is output. Um, I'm going to talk about differential operators. Because um, a differential operator is an example of a linear operator from a one function space to another. Okay. Then some of you heard me use that term before. <clears throat> okay. Um, now, we assume that the dimension of V is M and the dimension of W is M. Um, and we also have bases. So for V we have V1, V2, up to Vn. And then for W, we have W1, W2, up to Wm. Okay. Um, then, um, if I apply my linear transformation F to any vector in the basis for V, then what I get is some vector, this whole thing, is in W. But any vector in W is a unique linear combination of these vectors, because they're also a basis. So I'll name these coefficients in linear combination, a1j, w1, plus a2j, w2, and so on, plus amj, wm, which I'll also write in sigma notation, okay. 
so I can uh, express it that way. Um, so, uh, but I can do this for j going from 1 to n. And what do I have? I have a matrix of coefficients. So, I can say that a that consists of all of these coefficients That, this is called the matrix of F with respect to these bases that I described for V and W. In other words, if I use a different basis for V or W, that's going to change the matrix. So, uh, so that's important. Like, uh, uh, wait, sorry, matrix of little F, my linear transformation, not big F for field. Okay. Um, and Each column, column J, can be used to describe F of BJ. Uh, because all of these coefficients, A, I, J, where J is fixed, that refers to all the entries in column J. And this sum is going over, going from one row to the next. That's A, I, J. Okay. All right, so a matrix can, if you have bases in mind, a matrix can be used to describe your linear transformation uh, completely. Okay. Um, now, let's let V be R, N, and then W be R, M. Um, so in that case, um, and, we, and we'll also um, I'll use the standard basis for both. Okay. Um, so that means that any vector x in V, which is R n, x is equal to a linear combination of your standard basis vectors e1, e2, up to em. Um, but then f of x um, is a linear is a sum of these coefficients, and because it's linear, I can just take f of each of these uh, standard basis vectors. But each of these standard basis vectors is equal to a sum of, if I want to have over there, of these coefficients, my matrix elements, times my basis vectors for W, which are standard basis vectors of uh, RM. So, um, so what that means is, I can use a matrix to give me a very simple description of F, I know it's 625. I'm stopping soon, I swear to God. Okay. Um, so y is equal to f of x. What that means is yi, the ith component, is equal to um, the coefficient of ei, because all the components of ei are zero except for the ith one in this expression that I wrote earlier. If 
But that coefficient is equal to um, what I have for a specific i. And that's going to be the sum a i j x j. Okay. Um, so, so this is used to describe each component of f of x. So, uh, so this is the definition of a matrix vector product. Y is equal to A times X. So we're no longer writing F of X. A describes a linear transformation completely. So we just say Y is equal to AX. Um, so matrix vector multiplication, we'll, we'll see, is used to define systems of linear equations. Um, but using concepts related to multiplication, like identity and inverses, helps describe solutions of such systems of equations. So I want to just define this very important operation uh, before we go forward. Uh, uh, but it all comes from uh, working with the you know, standard basis of uh, vector spaces and using matrices to describe linear transformations. Okay, so um, know this operation because it's going to be so important all semester long. <clears throat> okay, we're done. Get out. <laughs> yes. <laughs>